Welcome to episode 40 of Lucretius Today. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with my panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius's poem and discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. None of us are professional philosophers, and everyone here is a self-taught Epicurean. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. This week, we're going to be discussing the Latin text from Book 3, starting at around line 161, and our subject is going to be the nature of the mind and soul. Let's now join today's discussion with Elaine reading the text. This mind can think of itself alone and of itself rejoice when the soul and body are no ways affected. As when the head or the eye is hurt by sensible pain, we are not tormented all over the body. So the mind is sometimes grieved or cheered with joy when the other part, the soul, diffused through the limbs, is agitated with no new motion at all. But when the mind is shaking with violent fear, we see the soul through all the limbs partakes of the same disorder. Cold sweats and paleness spread all of the body over, the tongue falters, the speech fails, the eyes grow dim, the ears tingle, and the limbs quake. In short, we often see men fall down from a terror of the mind, from whence we may easily conclude that the soul is united with the mind, and when she is pressed forcibly with its impulse, then she drives on the body and puts it in motion. By this rule, therefore, we find that the nature of the mind and soul is corporeal, for we see it shakes the limbs, rouses the body from sleep, changes the countenance, and directs and governs the whole man, nothing of which can be done without touch, and there can be no touch without body. Should we not then allow that the mind and soul are corporeal in their nature? Besides, you see the mind suffers with the body and and bears a share with it and all it endures, If the violent force of a dart pierces the body and shatters the bones and nerves, though death does not instantly follow, yet a faintness succeeds, and a sort of pleasing desire of sinking into the ground, a passionate resolution to die, and then again the will fluctuates and wishes to live. The mind, therefore, must needs be of a corporeal nature because it suffers pain by the stroke of darts, which we know are bodies. I shall now go on to explain clearly of what sort of body this mind consists and of what principles it is formed. And first I say that the mind is composed of very subtle and minute seeds, that it is so attend closely, and you will find that nothing is accomplished with so much speed as what the mind attempts and proposes to execute. The mind, therefore, is swifter in its motion than anything in nature we can see or conceive, But that which is so exceedingly quick to move must consist of the roundest and most minute seeds that may be set a-going by the lightest impulse. So water is moved and disposed to flow by ever so little force because it is composed of small and slippery seeds. But the nature of honey is more tenacious. Its moisture is more unactive and its motion slower. Its principles stick closer among themselves And for this reason, because it consists of seeds not so smooth, so subtle, and so round. And thus, a large heap of poppy seeds is blown away by the gentlest breath of wind and scattered abroad. But no blast can shake a heap of stones or darts. Therefore, the smoother and smaller the principles of bodies are, the more easily they are disposed to motion. And the heavier and rougher the seeds are, the more fixed and stable they remain. Since, therefore, the nature of the mind is so exceedingly apt to move, it must needs consist of small, smooth, and round seeds. And your knowing this, my sweet youth, will be found of great use and very seasonable for your future inquiries. This will discover clearly to you its nature, of what tenuous parts it is formed, and how small a space it might be contained if it could be squeezed together. For when the calm of death has possession of a man and the mind and soul are retired, you will find nothing taken away from the body as to its bulk, nothing as to its weight. Death leaves everything complete except the vital sense and the warm breath. The whole soul, therefore, must needs be formed a very small seed as it lies diffused through the veins, the bowels, and the nerves. 
because when it is wholly left every part of the body, the outward shape of the limbs remains entire, and they want not a hair of their weight. And this is the nature of wine when the flavor of it is gone, and of ointments when their sweet odors are evaporated into air. And thus it is when any moisture perspires through the pores of the body, the bulk does not appear less to the eye upon that account, nor is there anything taken off from the weight. For many and small are the seeds that compose the moisture and the smell and the contexture of all bodies. And therefore, we may be well assured that the nature of the mind and soul is formed of exceeding little principles, because when it leaves the body, it detracts nothing from the weight. Okay, thank you, Elaine, for reading that today. Now, we got lots of interesting stuff. (laughs) There are lots of interesting things here. That's correct. Um, Any particular one you want to jump in? Because there are some background issues that I want to discuss today, but I don't want to let the background issues obscure us uh, dealing with any details that you find interesting. Okay, so as a, uh, it's almost he's he's trying to play neuroscientist here and physicist. So it's I think this is especially interesting to me being a physician and it does continue to read as the mind. I would think the modern day look would be the brain and then the soul, the, the nervous system. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system is how we would look at this today. And so the first paragraph he's talking about the sympathetic nervous system with, you know, fear and anxiety. Those are, he has made a nice close observation of the effects of the sympathetic activation of the nervous system. All of those, the coldness and the paleness and the sweats and the vision dimming and shaking. This is a very observant. From a medical standpoint, I, I'm pleased. Elaine, you want to go ahead, or I got a question of what you yeah, just said. Yeah, I know. Let, let's let's do each paragraph separately, uh, okay, so that we can all. You were just equating the the mind and the soul to some modern terms. Yeah, yeah. Which were which were those two again? You were saying. Well, he uses mind and soul, and then for me, what would be accurate for how he's describing it based on what we now know would be the brain or the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Okay. My question is going to be, which one of those two is the one that has the wings that flies to heaven when you die and plays a harp for eternity? Well, that, you know, for uh, Christians, that would be the soul, but they don't really separate that. I think they use... I don't know, like your your soul and your mind maybe are not separate for them. I'm not really sure. I find that I, whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was obviously being facetious to some degree, but yeah, I guess to, yeah. in order to keep track of what he's even talking about, you kind of have right. to look at it from a couple different perspectives. I guess when he says the soul, he's talking about the thing people think of as being the real you. The, the real, real you or yeah. almost maybe – I, another way he could be doing it for him uh, would be the cognitive, you know, the thought part of the mind, the mind that thinks, and then the soul might be the feelings, the the emotional. And, and in that sense, they would all be still part of the nervous system. So, that you know, that's another possibility. I mean, I know even in this paragraph, he talks about the tongue faltering and speech failing and so forth. So yeah. what I was about to say there is that maybe at least one thing to consider is that the mind can get confused and can get all sorts of disruption going on in it. And yet whatever it is you're thinking is you is really staying the same, presumably, while your mind is confused. So I don't know which of uh, I don't think you... he's I don't think he's saying that. I think mm-hmm. he's actually saying that's not true, that, that the soul is united with the mind and, and both of them are affected together. Mm. That's yeah. his argument that they are together is that they yeah. are affected together. Right. And then the nature of the, the second paragraph, the nature of the mind and the soul being corporeal, meaning that only a thing that is material can affect a material thing. And also the, the mind, the thinking is affected by material action on the body. So this is actually one of the modern atheist arguments against mm-hmm. the soul. You still see this exact line of reasoning when you read modern atheism sort of evangelical uh, work. And I don't know if those writers 
are aware that Epicurus, I wonder if he you know, was the first and Lucretius, the, the first record of that line of argument. This argument being, Elaine, that the soul must be bodily because it can only affect the body if itself is bodily. Is that what you're saying? Or? That and that the where he says the mind suffers with the body, mm-hmm. uh, because that's mm-hmm. one of the modern arguments that, OK, if there's something that's you that's not the body, why, when you get a brain injury, are you different? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. How, how mm-hmm. could that be? That whole the 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 mind is the brain um, mm-hmm. kind of argument. The only legit arguments against that now are actually more that the mind is the brain plus the environment that because the brain is constantly acting with the environment and is not in a vacuum. And that's a that's a legit point of view, but it's still all material versus the supernaturalist or universal consciousness or, you know, those kinds of arguments that say well the mind is more like a the brain is more like a radio that's just picking up the signal from this incorporeal but how could it you know how can it what's the interface how can that interact if the signal is not also material yep makes sense to me i have more comments about the second two but i, I want to hear yeah, from I, uh charles yes and martin charles not that I have uh, a lot to say on it, but just a lot has already been said. As we move to the second part of what we're going to be talking about today, it looks like to me it divides kind of in half. The part that Elaine's been talking about already is ultimately the issue that the mind and the soul are corporeal. Mm-hmm. Then then the next two paragraphs are going to be a lot of detail about exactly what type of corporeal and how fast it moves and so forth. So there's really a kind of a, a good division point right here to talk about whether you do you have anything else on just the issue of whether the mind and the soul are bodily in nature, corporeal in nature, elemental in nature, or even energy or whatever? It's a bit indirect or not directly related to um, the next paragraph subject matter, but uh, I was thinking of the distinctions of how pleasure is often identified, you know, moving static or uh, mental and physical, the implications of that with just sort of a conjoined mind and body. It got me on a whole whole other line of thinking that's not related to this <laughs> section, so I've been quiet thinking on that. <laughs> well, if you're trying to extend this discussion to whether that means pleasure and pain are also ultimately corporeal as well, I guess I guess that's true. Mm-hmm. I guess that's, that is um, that is an implication of this. That's that's generally along the line I was thinking. I wrote a little note on the first paragraph on my doc of it. I only wrote a few words, but it went beyond that. I heard Elaine gasp, though, a moment ago. So No, I didn't gasp. I was just I was about to ask him to say more specifically about where he was going. That pain and pleasure being corporeal doesn't make sense to me. The mind that experiences, I mean, pain and pleasure are more like events, and the mind mm-hmm. that experiences them is yeah. corporeal, but there is not like an object that you can point to that is it's pleasure. pain or pleasure. Right. There's not a pleasure atom or a plain atom. There's not a mind I mean, atom. We discussed that because some extent. Right. We discussed that, that some, but so there are, of course, there are neurotransmitters. I don't mean that, but the actual experience is subjective. Objective, it's not like in the endorphin molecule, right? It's mm-hmm. it's a it's an it's an event. Martin, you have anything while Charles is looking? Uh, yeah, yes. So the first two paragraphs. Huh? So he stays pretty much close to the observation, and he uses only the basic assumption that everything is based on uh, particles and voids, and there is nothing supernatural. So that means these first two paragraphs seem to me a, a fairly correct description. Yeah. Yeah. This is another example of you're more likely to be right if you if you stick with observable things. So that's that's a cool point. Well, we can move on to the second half or Charles, are you still looking for something you want to talk about? No, I was looking into the uh, the mind body issue, but it's sort of looking like a dead end. Well, Elaine, do you want to go further on the next paragraph? Okay, so as Martin has said, the, the first the first two sections will be pretty solid. They're based on observations. He hasn't said anything that we can't defend today. Maybe, you know, using different words, but the basics 
seem pretty right. Then he starts getting back into extrapolating from what he has observed to what he hasn't observed, and he starts making mistakes. So this is, you know, a good lesson for vetting scientists who might be listening to this. And we've talked. I don't. I don't want to belabor this because we we talked about some of these issues with the seeds before. I do think it's interesting that just his observations that he's he's looking at things like viscosity of fluids. I mean, that, that just shows you the detailed level, level of his of his observations that he's noticing these things. And I, th- I think that's impressive. He clearly, when he talks about the mind being so fast, swifter in its motion than anything in nature we can see or conceive. Of course, we would say now, what about light, the speed of light? Um, the, the brain is not as fast <laughs> as the speed of light. And he, I, I, you know, I guess they hadn't conceived of electrical uh, impulses traveling down the nerves. I don't know when the first time was that somebody realized that. So that that's an interesting thing. But that's why the nervous system communicates so quickly is, is electrical occurrence. We're, we're electric creatures. Was that a... I think that was, Gava, that was, what? I think, Galvani, Galva, Galvani about 600 years ago. Okay, so it's it's a long time after him. So it makes me think of Walt yeah. Whitman. I, I sing the body electric. He's made some mistakes as far as the weight. Of course, all this stuff about weighing the body after death reminds me of those attempts to weigh the soul, you know, by Christians. But he's incorrect. Insensible fluid loss through the um, skin does affect the weight. He just didn't have instruments that were that, you know, could measure that accurately. The loss of aromatic particles from substances that have smells, those are molecules that does affect the weight. But the soul has no weight. I still never have been able to show any kind of thing like that. Mm, 30 grams. 30 grams. What? There are measurements out which show it's 30 grams, but others dispute. They say this is just noise, which is overinterpreted. So there right. is a, there's a number out there that it weighs 30 grams. Uh, yeah, there is, they have that number, but I don't think that's a scientifically valid. Assertion. I don't think also, but, but that, <laughs> that number you may encounter sometimes. <laughs> Martin, what was the word you're using? Did you say certigram or no, what? 30 grams. Oh, okay. The soul weighs 30 grams. I thought it, I thought it was 21 grams. And, and if the soul <laughs> weighs something, then... It actually is material still if it's leaving because only material things have a weight, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, mean, I have done in a number of occasions uh, measurements of water evaporating. Yeah. And this is very difficult because yes. if, you, if you use a very sensitive balance, no? then you, you want to look at the effect you have there on the weight, but then water can behave very funny and changes uh, your weight in a way uh, which is not producing. So, so, so like, for example, I try to determine the age of uh, uh, eggs by spectroscopy, and then I con, uh, controlled uh, their weight, and typically the weight was down, but then there was a leak in the bath, water bus where I kept them and then they suddenly increased weight because a little bit water made it back to the shell. No? So and all kinds of things and or when we do play, uh, when we try to weigh chemicals no? they can be hygroscopic so then you put them on the balance and the weight goes up this time without that you add anything or the, there is the moist and loose water no? so, so so you you, you have difficulty to to make accurate chemistry because of you have very small changes there so if someone is telling me he puts a 70 kilogram human who is about to die on the balance and then consider 30 grams as something significant that is plain nonsense it's 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 interesting how relevant all of this is to today's uh, arguments between atheists and religionists yeah, that's where this is always going to go back to the issue of whether there's an immortal soul that is going to survive the body after death. I suppose it doesn't completely answer the question. When you say the mind and soul are corporeal, like like Epicurus is saying here, I, I suppose somebody could still argue that a corporeal soul could be immortal. But the argument will continue on as we proceed past today to show that that's not the case. Charles? No, I was just reading into the whole weight of the soul. It's called the 21 grams experiment. I remember he- hearing about that on like seventh grade. Is that a Wikipedia page? 21 yeah. grams? Yeah, let me just link it. 
Well, Elaine, more on the second half here? No, I don't I don't want to go into detail about the, the errors because I, I just feel like we've covered that in other sections. Um, okay. It's I, that enough to note that when it comes up, but, um, but we don't need to belabor it. Go, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, but, but I have something a bit in defense. I, of course, I completely agree that he uses the wrong model of hard body interactions of these inter, uh, uh, particles and then all these yeah, wrong statements come. But on the other hand, we, it has something in it, there, uh, this conclusion that uh, they have to, have to be uh, lightweight because when we see what is involved in uh, moving, now, then we see that uh, the piles are long enough. That one is just uh, the, uh, the, an electro, uh, electrical pulse, no? and that can then move with 100 meters per second around in the fastest case or for, for other cases then, then slower. And what m moves as a material thing are then very lightweight ions like potassium and sodium. No? So that means it's not completely wrong what he comes there. So it is a fairly small particles which are involved in the uh, transportation of information along nerve fibers. No? Anybody want to carry that in any direction? Hmm. No, I'm curious what you were thinking like in addition to this, what, what you were thinking that we need to cover? Well, I'd like to go back and clean up a little bit from last week uh, based on some links that Charles provided on, on uh, Harmony and some, some oh, Socratic okay, arguments. Okay. But before we go further, we have to come to an agreement. Are we going to pronounce the name of this dialogue Fido like the dog or Fado? Should be Fado, no? Fado? Do you agree, Elaine, Charles? Um, I, I wouldn't be Fado, at, the, the A-E noise. Okay. Because Fado. it's Greek, not it's A-E, because it, in Latin it's different, so it's, it's like a, it can be either a long E or a long A. <laughs> That's not helpful. We'll call it Fado in honor of Martin today. I, it's prob I presume that's probably right. There are several things there that I've wanted to at least bring out in these discussions so that people will know that we are aware of them as well. The reason we got into it last week was Charles found the link about, I think it was Simeus who made the argument to Socrates, Phaedo being the dialogue in which Socrates is giving his last speech to his uh, followers in prison right before he drinks the hemlock. So this is the dialogue in which Socrates is going to give his most elaborate and refined defense of whether the soul is immortal, what happens to you after you die, and all of these really super serious issues about death and, and what happens afterwards, if anything. And so it's way too complicated to go into tremendous detail today, but I think what we can talk about is that Socrates starts off, they're all sitting around waiting. For, apparently there was a long delay in Socrates' execution. I didn't know these details. The, the elders of Athens had sentenced him to death, put him in prison, but they could not execute the, the death sentence immediately because just by chance, the tradition was that some particular ship that had to go in a particular direction to a, a, a shrine, apparently, was leaving the next day. And under the tradition, they could not execute anybody until that procedure had been completed. So the scenario of Phaedo is that Socrates is in prison with, with some number of his people around him, which does not include Plato, but some number of his friends and followers around him. And the ship has returned, and so the execution of the sentence of death is imminent. And so he gets into a final discussion with these people about what's going to happen to him and why they should not be so despondent about his death, because he's going to a better place. So the dialogue starts off with Socrates giving a couple of arguments in favor of why he thinks that his soul is going to survive his death. And he sort of stops and, and asks his people if they agree with him and if they have been persuaded. And they have not been persuaded. And so one of the arguments that is raised to him, I think it is by the Simeus that Charles mentioned. Simeus says that the soul could be like a harmony, that when you have a, a lyre, uh, any kind of harp, whatever kind of musical instrument you're talking about, once the musical instrument has been destroyed, once its pieces have been disrupted, the harmony is gone as well. And so he says to Socrates, well, soul could be like that. And so just because the soul doesn't inhabit any particular part of it, just because the soul is, is uh, something that's basically on top of the body and separate from the body, it still could be destroyed when the body is gone. 
on. So it's a uh, argument that does kind of track some of the Epicurean arguments that the soul cannot survive outside the body. But then as the dialogue goes further, Socrates pulls out his ultimate argument about why the soul is immortal. And this is the kind of argument that Elaine would hate and detest, I think. But we need to keep in mind the relationship to the Epicurean responses to all this. The argument that he comes up with has several different steps, one of which relates, I think, to the pleasure issue. His first argument about why the harmony argument is not correct is Plato says that harmonies have degrees. You can have more or less harmony in a musical passage. And so Plato's point is, because harmony can be more or less harmonic, that means that the soul cannot be a harmony because their premise has been that the soul is perfect and immortal. So he dismisses the harmony argument by saying that harmonies by nature are imperfect and can't have anything to do with the soul. The reason I think that's significant is I think that is very similar to the argument about pleasure because they take the position that anything that can be made greater or lesser by degrees cannot be perfect or part of an, an ideal. So he starts out dismissing harmony basically on the same grounds that they dismiss pleasure as being possibly the ultimate good. And I'm going on too long here. I'm going to summarize this by saying this, that the argument that the soul is immortal comes down to a definition. What is it that makes something beautiful? Beautiful is, is one of the things they discuss in here. And Plato takes the position that you can't really describe what makes something beautiful other than to say that it partakes in the ideal of beauty. Charles, I want you to jump in at some point because I know you've probably seen some of these arguments and have some commentary that might explain it better than I'm doing. But the ultimate argument about what makes something beautiful or what makes something great or what makes something small is that there is an ideal of beauty, there's an ideal of greatness, and there's an ideal of smallness. And if something is small, it is because it contains within it the form of smallness. If something <laughs> is beautiful, if something is beautiful, it is because it partakes of the ideal of beauty that exists mm -hmm. in another part of the universe or, or heaven or wherever. Uh, I don't mean to cut off too much. <laughs> But I got to drop one more thing into it, because the reason that we know the soul is immortal, basically, is that the only way you understand what beauty or smallness or greatness is, is because you were born with that knowledge that you brought into this existence from your pre-existence. Yes, the theory that, of recollection. That is the recollection <laughs> argument. No matter how many beautiful paintings, no matter how many beautiful songs, no matter how many beautiful men or women you come into contact with, you're never really sure that those particular individuals are beautiful or not, except to the extent that you can identify within them their participation in this ideal form of beauty. And it's very difficult for me to summarize and bring this all back into the immortality argument. But that's where he gets his ideas and his proof that the soul is immortal. He concludes the dialogue by saying this. Here, here's the heading from the Wicked Source article that we may now say that not life makes something alive, but the soul makes it alive. And the soul has a life-giving power which does not admit of death and is therefore immortal. Socrates' question is this. Tell me then, what is it that of which, if you have it, the body becomes alive? And the answer is the soul. And Socrates says, and is it always the case? And I guess it's Simeon says, yes, of course. Then whatever the soul possesses to that, she comes bearing life. Yes, certainly. And is there any opposite to life? There is. And what is that? Death. But the soul has been acknowledged will never receive the opposite of what she brings. Impossible, replied Cebes, Sebs. Charles, how would you say C-E-B-E-S? Um, <laughs> B in Greek. Oof. Well, let's just call him Sebi, Kebis for the, just, for, the, for the time being. I think it would be a V. Sevi, is it a hard C or a soft C? Sevis or Kebis? C-E-B-E-S. I want to say hard. Okay, Keb, let's just call him Kebis. Impossible replied Kebis. And now he said, what did we just now call the principle that repels the even? 
And the answer is the odd. And what principle repels the musical or the just? The unmusical, he said, and the unjust. And what do we call the principle that does not admit of death? The immortal, he said. And does the soul admit of death? No. Then the soul is immortal. Yes, he said. And we may say that this has now been proven. Yes, abundantly proven, Socrates, <laughs> Kebbi's reply. That is what these guys are doing. They're defining words in a way that they think makes sense. And they're building a chain argument of definitions by which they can conclude that the soul is immortal based on how they've defined these words of immortal and soul. They're not looking at individual people or experiences or atoms that make up the soul. They are playing a word exercise. I don't know whether this is called an ontological proof. What is that, Elaine? You may know the answer to that. What's the ontological proof that there's a God? Is oh, that? I, I don't know. Um, I uh, have to look that up. Yeah, th there's a whole lot here far beyond the scope of what we could deal with today over the next few minutes. But the, we'd the have to look I at wanted, like Saint Anselm for that stuff. Okay. The point I wanted to raise is that this would have been probably as familiar to the ancient Athenians of Epicurus's time as anything in the Bible is to us today. Okay. This, this... Here it is. Do you, I'm sorry. Do you want Go to... Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So it says, uh, this is the ontological proof. Uh, God, by definition, is that for which no greater can be conceived. God exists in the understanding. If God exists in the understanding, we could imagine him to be greater by existing in reality. Therefore, God must exist. Now, now, what do you make of that, Elaine? It's, it's ridiculous because it's the same. And, and really, it's the same problem in a more glaring form that is being made in, when uh, Lucretius gets off into these extrapolating stuff about seas that he hasn't seen. It's just it's like, as you said, it's using words and logic when you've never proven your premises and you just, you know, people get carried away with, oh, that must be right. And it sounds good but you've never made an observation. So just because I can imagine a unicorn in the sky does not mean there must be a unicorn in the sky. So when I say that, it's obvious, but that's really what he's doing. He's saying, well, if you, if, if you can conceive God and the understanding and that if God exists in the understanding, we could imagine him to substitute, we can imagine a unicorn in the sky. It, you know, there's no basis for that. There hasn't been no observation. So this is a perfect example of how reasoning should be secondary to evidence. You should use your reasoning on evidence and not just go off on your own with it. There is so much to unwind here, and I agree with what you said, Elaine. We're not going to be diverted from proceeding through the creed just like we need to proceed through them. But I guess as we come across some of these arguments we can go back and cite the context in, in which they arrive in, because I don't know which of these, if you had to, I've never read the majority of these dialogues. I think many of the people, most of the people that were going to be listening to these podcasts have probably never read these dialogues and they're never going to read these dialogues. We're going to have to find a way to explain the, the context without suggesting that people just become professional philosophers. But Phaedo here contains many of the arguments that ultimately Epicurus is rejecting from the issue of whether the, the senses are trustworthy or not to the issues of whether there's absolute justice and absolute beauty and so forth. And as I guess you would probably be fitting to include in his final statement before he was executed these are some of the most uh, important issues of philosophy. I mean, I was laughing all through when you read that because it sounds so ridiculous now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know why anybody would have ever thought that was anything other than ridiculous. And then when people say, oh, well, you know, at the time they didn't know this, that and the other. And I think, well, Epicurus knew it was ridiculous. So it was just as ridiculous back then. Uh, there are yeah. two sections um, from Phaedo, which I looked it up. Uh, I think it's called Phaedo. Phaedo. That would be another alternative. Not Phaedo, Phaedo, <laughs> yeah. but Phaedo. Phaedo. Okay. Apo apologies to our yeah, listeners who right. know how yeah. to speak Greek because we clearly don't. <laughs> yeah. Here I guess Phaedo is English Greek. Phaedo <laughs> is English pronunciation and not, not to Greek. 
I'm just partial to Fido because I like dogs. I'd like to think that it's about it's, it sounds like to me that this this whole the whole dialogue is about faith in an in an afterlife. And so I think of faith oh, and Fido as being Fido, going yeah. together. Oh, that's so okay. funny. All right, it says here, man. <laughs> this is from uh, who's saying this? In quote, the soul is immortal because it contains a principle of imperishableness. Nor does he himself seem at all to be aware that nothing is added to human knowledge by his safe and simple answer that beauty is the cause of the beautiful, and that he is merely reasserting the Iliadic being divided by the Pythagorean numbers against the Heraclitian doctrine of perpetual generation. Uh, that's from the introduction. Here's from the dialogue. While the first notion of immortality is only in the way of natural procreation or of posthumous fame and glory, the higher revelation of beauty, like the good in the Republic, is the vision of the eternal idea. So deeply rooted in Plato's mind is the belief in immortality, so various are the forms of expression which he employs. Uh, that was the ending. Uh, and then way later on, getting towards the end... Uh, this is uh, the same section that uh, uh, Godfrey posted. Nothing makes a thing beautiful, but the presence and participation of beauty in whatever way or manner obtained. For as to the manner, I am uncertain, but I stoutly contend that by beauty, all beautiful things become beautiful. <laughs> it's circular. It's, it, it's that, so that's one circular. Layer. Yeah. There's, um, oh, who was it? One of the uh, criticisms for uh, vitalism and like Elan Vital was that it was very, very circular. Uh, Moliere, uh, there's a example listed in one of his plays. This uh, quack doctor is being asked why opium causes sleepiness, uh, to which he replies, because of its soporific power. Which is just nothing other than using a different word to describe that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, one really interesting thing is this this uh, highlights how different the idea of the prolepsis is from the idea of an abstract ideal realm where you would know things like smaller and larger. Uh, um, right? I would, I would yes, kind I think of. so. I would it would be better uh, compared to uh, theory of recollection instead than just the forms. If we're talking of his knowledge, but the, it is still, it's a, it's a similar thing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, that yes. Epicurus uh, accounted for this argument about that's how we recognize this and that by bringing in the prolepsies, which if you look at developmental studies in humans today, we do think that, we come with some innate pattern recognitions, just like other species, that would explain how we know things are, are smaller and, and larger. And it's a neurologic inherited skill, like a, like a kind of like a sense. Charles, this may be you may be correct me on this. This may be an area where they were bouncing back and forth. If so, Plato was taking a recollection pre-existence of the soul argument. I gather Aristotle must have flip-flopped on them because he's the one who came up with the blank slate and said that there's no recollection, I think, uh, was Aristotle's position. So Epicurus is then taking a position that I think Elaine has just described, that correct, there is no pre-existence to the soul, but on the other hand, you are born with certain dispositions at the very least or in intuitive faculties that will will then dispose you in particular directions. So it, it's very deep. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't need a pre-life. You don't need right. an eternal existence to be able to have these features of human biology. It's, it's really it's really wonderful that he, mm -hmm. he, is, he hasn't left anything unexplained, Epicurus, um, as, as far as, you know, uh, this whole idealistic realm. There's just no... There's no need for it. Yeah, Aristotle did reject the theory of forms because of his reputation as a, as a scientist or natural philosopher. He did reject the forms, and um, a lot of his epistemology is based off of uh, induction, but some of the stuff like his teleology would sort of deviate from that, and he would incorporate both induction and deduction. We're going to need to begin to come to conclusions for yeah. today or at the end of the session today. But there's, there's one more thing, and maybe this is where I'd like to close it, is that it's interesting to me that one of the things that 
that Socrates, Plato says in the midst of all this is that he says no worse thing can happen to a man than this. And I would almost like to play a game of try to guess what it is that he thinks is the worst thing that can happen to a man. In the context of what we're discussing about the ideal forms, you can almost guess what he might say is the worst thing that could happen to a man. And here it is. I'm just going to read this paragraph. It's all very short. These, these major principles are stated in very concise terms in these dialogues. He says, first, let's take care that we avoid a danger. Lest we become, and the, here's a, a word that people aren't going to be familiar with, misologists, which means haters of ideas. Lest we become misologists, he replied. No worse thing can happen to a man than this. For as there are misanthropists or haters of men, there are also misologists or haters of ideas. And both spring from the same cause, which is ignorance of the world. Misanthropy arises out of the too great confidence of inexperience. You trust a man and you think him altogether true and sound and faithful, and then in a little while he turns out to be false and knavish, and then another and another. And when this has happened several times to a man, especially when it happens among those who he deems to be his own trusted and familiar friends, he hates at last all men and believes that no one has any good in him. And then he continues on and says the same thing happens to ideas that you should not lose your faith in ideas just because you can't seem to use them like you'd like to use them. So I bring that up because it's almost like it's almost like a religious argument too. Don't give up your faith in ideas even though ideas as the way he is describing them seem to be so ridiculous to us from our perspective. So you know, we use the word idea to mean a thought or something else. He's really talking about these ideal forms. He's saying don't give up your faith in these ideal forms just because of the difficulties you have in applying them. And I don't know about that, but there's so much Christianity, Judaism, there's so much religion that you can read into this Socratic Platonic material. It's it's very, very profound and has to be dealt with at a very deep level so that you can even understand where they're coming from. Okay, Martin, closing thoughts for today. Uh, yeah, so just... Uh... Uh, I want to add to the uh, weight. So uh, it seems 21 gram is uh, mentioned a lot more often. I couldn't find the reference for 30 gram, but uh, uh, the, in, the, in these first measurements, they had a range of 10 to 30 gram uh, reportedly. So they are, uh, they are, so, so you, you find 30 grams somewhere as well, but 21 gram is much more common to find. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You have to take care of that 21 grams, I guess, however we do it. That 21 grams is very just, important. How do they go from it having a weight to it being non-material? Maybe the people who are weighing the soul are ultimately on the atheist side, and maybe they're the ones who are saying it's corporeal. That's not a Christian argument that it's got weight. Martin, or, do you associate that with the I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I didn't take it serious, so I didn't really follow up on the sources or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just read that sci real scientist uh, questions that anything of that is significant. And like I mentioned before, from my own experience with uh, measuring weight, a 30 gram difference on a 70 kilogram base weight doesn't look uh, very difficult to do. All right, here's a live science article on that. It was a Massachusetts doctor named Duncan McDougall, great name, devised experiments in 1907 that he thought would weigh the soul. So, um, and he used six terminally ill patients on a scale bed, measured their weight before, during, and after death. For So for six patients, he got an average of 21 grams on average. Closer examination However, revealed pr profound flaws. He used a very small sample size, obviously. Oh, and, he, and he, he kicked out two of them, so he only used four of the original ones. They didn't know the precise moment of death in 1907, and it was just sloppy science, but it has persisted like an uh, urban legend. <laughs> Well, if I were in my familiar role as a defender of Epicurus to the nth degree, I would say that probably 
the reason they're getting into these details, which we're criticizing to some degree as being inaccurate, is that they are wanting to put together a plausible theory. You know, we think we have a mind. We think we have something going on inside our bodies. So people are going to want to have some kind of an understanding of what that is. And Epicurus and Lucretius are offering them an explanation in which whatever it is that's going on within our brains and our hearts, it's not something that requires a lot of substance to it. It's very light and thin and moves very fast. And we don't know much more about it than that, but it's not mystical. But this is the way in which you can have these things going on with within your body as, as a speculation, I guess, is one reason they would go in that direction. And then, of course, it also gives you the answer that if it's part of the body, then it's going to die with the body. I think uh, this little excerpt gives us some insight into his beliefs. For four years, all was quiet on the McDougal front. But in 1911, he graced the New York Times front page with an announcement that he had up the ante. This time, he wouldn't be weighing the human soul. He'd be photographing it at the moment it left the body. (laughs) Although he expressed concern that the soul substance might become too agitated to be photographed at the moment of death. (laughs) Hmm. Oh my god. (laughs) We've probably got pictures of the aura, you know, the word aura. Yeah. Elaine, you're into all, know that better than I do. People, they think they can take pictures of some field so, around your body. Yeah, aura is actually interesting. Now, of course, we do because we're electrical beings. Mm-hmm. You know, we have we have electrical, we have fields, but we um, aura is probably, from what I can tell, part of synesthesia. All right, what's that word mean? What is synesthesia? So synesthesia means when your senses, and, you know, there may be a part of the poem that, that we can talk more about that, but where your senses are kind of cross-communicating neurologically. So there are people who hear certain notes and see certain colors, like the the frequency of an A sharp is always going to be the same color for them. Not everybody has it, but it's not exceedingly rare. I have a form of synesthesia myself called lexico-emotional synesthesia, so that certain feelings and certain words have colors and tastes. <laughs> so it's not everything. I'm not going around like colors everywhere, but bitter, you know, my my brain not all that creative. So bitter is, uh, it tastes bitter if you're a bitter person, if you have a bitter feeling, and it's sort of a bile green so obviously neurologically there's some stuff going on there so the the idea is that there a synesthesia is more frequent in people who report being able to see auras and so likely they are seeing their reactions to people as a a color around them that just reflects their emotional response to that person okay well i'm seeing red as a stop sign for us to complete the podcast for today anybody have anything else before we come to an end? No, no, not from me. No, I'm, I think we did. This was an interesting section. Okay, very good. We'll do it again next week. Martin? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, thanks and bye. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>